And there are different things that, you know, that lend to a happy marriage. But when they look at like, what is the number one predictor of, hey, this marriage is going to make it, they're going to have a happy marriage. And it is probably something that won't surprise us. It's commitment. So Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning into the call where we discuss topics that are leading you to Christ. And my guest today is Arlene Pelican. She's the host of Happy Home Podcast and the author of several books, including 31 Days to a Happy Husband and 31 Days to Becoming a Happier Wife. And today we're going to be talking about National Marriage Week, which is February 7th through 14th, reminding us that marriage is more than a day or even a ceremony. So Arlene, thank you for joining me and talking about National Marriage Week. Why is it important? I love that you started. It's not just a day in a ceremony. So National Marriage Week is kind of like, hey, let's remember this is a celebration. Like, let's remember you hear a lot of bad news about marriage. If someone's talking about marriage, they're bemoaning their spouse, they're saying, oh, I wish I was free or whatever it is. And to realize that, you know, one week a year during National Marriage Week, we want to promote marriage, elevate marriage, celebrate marriage, and show the world that marriage is a good thing. It's to be celebrated. It's a blessing in our lives, not a curse. It's it's good for us as individuals. It's good for societies. And so National Marriage Week is, a, is an effort to bring people together uh, around the idea of marriage and then to support current marriages to say like, hey, we're in this together. Let us help you. And then to inspire those who are perhaps not married to think that, you know, this is this is a viable option. <laughs> so yeah. that's what that's what National Marriage Week is about. I love that. And, you know, I didn't even know there was a national. How long has that been going on? 1996. But you're right. Like a lot of things. And that's why I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk about it, because it was founded in 1996. But like all sorts of movements, we you need more people to know about it. So, yeah, we're yeah. so glad to be able to talk about it. What are some of the steps that someone can take towards a happier marriage. I could have yeah. used this a long time ago. Yes. Where the heck were you? <laughs> I know. We're, we're right here, we're right here. You know, um, we lean on the research of, of Brad Wilcox, who's at the University of Virginia. He's a sociologist, uh, part of the National Marriage Project. And there are different things that, you know, that lend to a happy marriage. But when they look at like, what is the number one predictor of, hey, this marriage is going to make it, they're going to have a happy marriage. And it is probably something that won't surprise us. It's commitment. So you start with that idea that this marriage is a commitment. I am making a vow. I will promise to keep my vow. I will, you know, I'm not going to wait for you to keep your end of the vow. I'm going to keep my end of the vow. And then when both people do that, you can imagine what happens. But we are living in an age where marriage is not about commitment. Marriage is about like uh, expressing oneself, finding one's soulmate, that as long as you are making my life better, as long as you are adding to my life, as long as you are, you know, like helping me grow as an individual, then, then, Hey, this marriage is working. But the moment, right. That it's like, wait, this is not fun anymore. And you're more of a problem than you are a help. Then it's like, I'm going to jettison this marriage. So we are in this age where, where we're not thinking commitment. We're not thinking vow. We're thinking, you know, when, what does this do for me? And when this stops doing something for me, I'm out. So we really want to help people see that, you know, that there is a, a, a much different way to look at marriage as a commitment. And when you do keep your commitments, uh, how much happier you are. But to go back to your question of like, okay, let's say you say, yes, I am committed. I want to be committed. How can I have a better marriage? There are three keys that we have seen um, that that work. One of them is speaking each other's love language. And we can go in depth on any of these things, but speaking each other's love language. Another um, one is date nights, like continually spending time with one another, investing in each other. And then the third is just realizing you need to grow. Like you just cannot stay static. You just can't be on autopilot in your marriage that you must do things to grow. So if you really think to yourself, wait, okay, we're speaking each other's love languages. We are growing, like we're doing things to grow close together and that we go on date nights. You're going to, you're going to have a pretty good, you're going to be doing pretty good compared to the general population. Yeah. But we're coming out of the gate. Sometimes people just have a really hard time. Listen, pride is the number one thing that stops you from having a happier marriage, right? Yeah. So you could, there's so many, sometimes in a marriage, 
like you were talking about, you know, you know, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. You have to get rid of that stony heart. And so, so, uh, you know, I always say, you know, to the people that I, I know, I'm not a marriage expert by far, but I can say that I had to pray and ask yeah. God to remove the stones from my heart, the stony heart, and give me a heart of flesh from Ezekiel. Right. As soon as I started to pray that, things changed between yeah. us. My heart changed towards him. And so then his heart changed towards me. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of you, but I, right. I, can you speak into that? Yeah. You know, I think of the five love languages and Dr. Gary Chapman, who created those out of you know his counseling practice of seeing like, wait a minute, he's saying he feels unloved. She's saying she feels unloved. And then he realized these five love languages, but in Dr. Chapman's own marriage, you know, he's been married. I don't know. I'm going to for sure more than 50 years, probably many more th- than that to his wife, but the early years, their first year, you know, he was a, a you know, a the, he was learning like theology, like he's a godly man, like he's going to be a missionary, he's going to do these things. And so but he's having marriage problems his first year and he's thinking, what in the world? And the Lord spoke to him very clearly, like serve her. And he was like, what, you know, serve her. And when he began just to serve her out of his wife, out of a, an an attitude of love, not wanting to get anything back. That's what started changing everything in the marriage. So there is this part of us, the pride part that says, I'm doing everything right already. You know, it's not me. I am the one putting in to this marriage. It's that person, whether, you know, it's your husband or wife listening, it's them, it's my spouse. And, and it is a humbling to recognize like, let it start with me. Let me start to serve my spouse. Let me start to pay attention to their needs and to meet them there, even if they don't respond in kind right away. Mm -hmm. But most of us, you know, have married decent people. You know, we didn't marry an ax murderer. We didn't marry this crazy, you know, totalitarian person. You know, for the most part, we have married a decent person. And when you start acting that way, a decent person realizes, oh, I I should reciprocate that. Like, I'm really being a jerk right now. And that's much better to give into your marriage and allow that change to happen than to, if you try to legislate that, force that, like, you need to change, you know, you need to do this for me. Nope, nobody's going to do that. Nobody wants to do that. And so I think you're right that identifying that pride can get in the way asking the Lord, give me a soft and humble heart. You know, I've been married for 25 years. And many times, you know, if my husband and I have a disagreement in my mind, automatically I'll think, well, I don't like him very much. Like, you know, he's being very difficult right now. I don't like him very much. (laughs) And what I've tried to train myself to do is then flip it and think, well, he probably doesn't like you very much either right now. Like he's probably thinking she (laughs) is being very annoying and petty and irritating and babyish or whatever it is. Right. (laughs) And just realizing that, wait, I am part of the problem also. Let me humble myself. And and there's so many times, you know, they're bathroom prayers, like you're having an argument, you go in the bathroom. And I just try to say, Lord, please help me to have a soft heart towards my husband. Help me to to not speak in anger or help me to see what what should be the next step and just guide us and help us. And and the Lord answers those prayers. The Lord helps you. The Lord shows you. And and I do think it's important um, to not make the small things big. A lot of times we we get all bent out of shape about the dishwasher not being out unloaded or the t-shirt on the floor. So don't make the small things big, but don't make the big things small. Mm-hmm. When there's something in your relationship that really does have a consequence that you will be thinking about five years from now, yeah. you need to not be quiet about that. And you need to to be able to express those kinds of things to your spouse. You know, it's funny you're, you're saying all that because also another way too is when the Holy Spirit convicts you, like if you've said something to yes. your husband or your wife or whatever, and all of a sudden the, the Holy Spirit will say, you know, go apologize. You're like, yes. I'm not, okay, right. I'm not going to do it, <laughs> That's right. you know, but you know, but then, you know, you know, because you're, you know, cause you're Christian and you want to have a Christ, a Christ type heart. You want to yeah. have a heart like Jesus. Right. So you have to kind of bend that pride yeah. And go and, and step out and go and apologize or try to talk it out a little bit because pride is like number one in a marriage and has separated people 
in so many ways I've seen over the years. I mean, can you give an example? I think that pride for sure is the thing because when you hear someone, well, why did you break up or why are you separated or, you know, what's happening? You know, they're not saying, well, it's because I humbled myself before my spouse or it's not because they said I told them I would go to counseling or, you know, th these are not the reasons, but it's because I wouldn't go to counseling. I didn't see the problem. It was them that was doing this. We just reached an impasse that we could not cross, like all those different yeah. things. And there are situations where that may be very true, but in many of those situations, it's pride that it's, we did not humble ourselves to, to take on the responsibility of, you know, I am part of this too. Even if the other person seems so egregious, like it's totally your fault that, that this was a team sport that we had drifted into this position. So a lot of marriage is, you know, at, at national marriage week, we talk about making those daily connections, dating weekly and getting away regularly. So it's building rhythms in your life because on your own, you cannot do marriage on autopilot. Like it feels like you should be able to, like you should be able to get married and then you're two able-bodied adults. So now you should be able to focus on your career, focus on your children and you know, all those kinds of things. And then if you have children, whether they're young or whether they're adult children and you have grandchildren, the kids need stuff right? So it's very imperative at that moment, like, oh, they need a diaper change or, oh, they need money for college. I got to go back to work or whatever it is. Whereas the adult in your life, your spouse, you're thinking like, oh, you can take care of yourself. You're fine. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the fallacy comes that you don't have to do anything in the marriage part. You have yeah. to work at the other parts where in truth, it's, wait a minute, this person I'm with, they're the person I am with till death do me part till death do us part. Like yeah. my children will, will grow up and leave my grandchildren. will. you know, I'm not the primary person in their life, you know, to realize that, wait a minute, it is my spouse. They are the person I should be investing in. And once we get that, a lot of times it takes a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're empty nesters and you're staring at each other. Like, Oh my word, we've drifted apart and you have this huge problem. So I think it's very important if you're, if you're pre problem, <laughs> <laughs> to realize that, oh, if I will make the commitment to daily connect with my spouse, and this could be 10 minutes sitting on the couch together after dinner and like, how was your day? And, you know, my husband loves foot rubs. It's like a foot rub at the end of the day. Tell me about your highlights today. What was, what happened that, that didn't go so well? You know, what's, what's going on? You know, just that daily connection where you're spending unhurried time, technologically free time with each other. And it could be just 10 minutes, could be a walk around the block. And then that day, day weekly, you know, it could be dinner. It could be a movie. It could be go out dancing. It could be do your hobby, or it really could be as simple as, Hey, let's eat our dinner outside today, you know, and, but it's, but it's on purpose. Like let's light a candle and eat our dinner outside today. It's just that you, you have a moment where you're looking forward to something together and then the getaway regularly. This is so important. Even when you have children, so even when we had little kids, it's like, we need a 24 hour getaway. It's not like, Hey, we're going to mom and dad are going to get away for four months now. <laughs> it's not that kind of getaway, <laughs> but, but a 24 hour getaway with your spouse once a year, twice a year does does wonders for the marriage because it reminds you that marriage of a husband and a wife but you chose this person and when you get away regularly it gives you that chance to rediscover why you chose them in the first place exactly and you know it, it changes up their routine too don't yes. you agree that novelty that's what's really nice about getting away or by dating is it gives novelty it gives like something different you know you're in a different setting you're doing something different and you know for date nights i know it can be hard you've been married for so long it's like what do we do we always go to the same restaurant we always go to the same place so that novelty piece could be that hey let's plan every other one like i plan one and then you plan the next one and you could do challenges of like like, hey, what can we do for $25 and try to figure out, you know, what can we do for $25? You can do, you know, let's not go to the same restaurant um, in a year. So we have to try every time we go out, we have to try a new restaurant in a year. So you could do very, you know, a lot of simple things to inject some novelty into your dating relationship. So can you give some um, some really good pointers on how to how the next generation can be influenced. Yes. Yeah. 
a huge thing of this is what are we modeling? What are, what are we showing? So what are, what are our actions towards our spouse? What are our words that we talk about marriage? So obviously in your home with your own children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, this is the most powerful place you can make an impact because these are the people that really see you. So for your, as you think about the, all the generations underneath you, what kind of marriage are you modeling to them? How are you portraying marriage to them? And it really is, I, I can see it in my own life. Like God gives us children and nieces and nephews in our life and all that to help us become more accountable, more better to rise up because you think like, Hey, do my kids want to grow up and have a marriage like mine? Right. But then guess what that does? That helps me elevate my marriage to a place of greater, you know, commitment, priority, fun, all those things. And then that's a blessing to me too, you know? So uh, I think realizing that the people underneath you first, that they're looking at you and then, you know, get involved, whether maybe you, you have a, a, like there's a Christian club, my kids go to public school, but I go to a Christian club at lunchtime once a week. So I'm meeting, you know, seventh graders and eighth graders and they know like I'm married and I'll talk about my husband sometimes and always in a very positive, fun good way. So I think taking opportunities, whether it's the youth of your church, whether you get involved in a boys and girls club, whether, you know, just try to look for opportunities to speak life about marriage into the next generation. And it, and it really could be, you know, my mentors, Bill and Pam Farrell, they've written 50 plus books about relationships. And both of them came from very broken homes um, found Jesus, got married in their 20s, had no idea what they were doing, but they knew they did not want to repeat the patterns of their parents. So when they were in church, they would look for the couples who were married for a long time, who were still holding hands, who were really nice to each other, and they would literally look for them and then sit close to them. And then after church, they would say, we know that we're newlyweds and we notice that you're very happy. Can you please help us and tell us like how you do that? And then invariably, these couples would say, of course, and they'd have lunch together and they'd become friends. And so look for these kinds of situations, you know, befriend a younger couple, look for these kinds of people in, in your church, um, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to the right people for them to find you, et cetera, and just be very open, I think, to being that kind of person. Because, you know, people are very into happiness right now. So they're very much like, well, that's the gauge. Does this make me happy? And that's what makes it good or bad or false or true. Does this make me happy? And many people think, well, marriage, that's not going to make me happy. But Brad Wilcox, who I talked about earlier, in terms of social science, the statistics are showing that, you know, people say, oh, if you have a good college education, if you make a lot of money, that's what you should do. That's going to make you happy. But no one's telling young people, if you will be in a committed marriage for the rest of your life, for the majority of your life, you are going to be so happy. Nobody's telling them that, you know, they're telling them the opposite, like, oh, you don't want to get married till you're much later in life. And then even then you don't really need the piece of paper to be happy, you know, but what Brad Wilcox is uh, research shows that if you have a college degree, it gives you a 64% boost in happiness. If you have a higher income than most, an 88% boost in happiness. If you're satisfied with your job, a 145% boost in happiness. If you are married, any just run-of-the-mill marriage, 151% boost in happiness, much more than college, money, good job. But if you're happily married, it gives you a 545% boost in happiness. So as they look at people... Those who are happily married have so much, and you can imagine, right? Because people are lonely. And if you are happily married, you know, it, it, it helps you not to be lonely. And when you have all the money in the world and a great education and a great job, but you go home and you're alone and you have no connection to people, then you can see what follows. So really, I think as we live it out, and as we educate young people and reach out to them, I think that will help to turn the tide for marriage. You know, you are the picture of happiness. You're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> the joy of the Lord is our strength, you know, but it really is true. Like, like gratitude, you know, I waited, you know, it's funny. I, I marry, we married in our late twenties and now that seems very normal, you know, like, yeah, that almost early. 
But when I was in college, all my my friends were getting married in their early 20s. And I thought like, wow, when am I ever going to get married? And I thought I'm never going to meet this guy from the movies who like picks up your books when they fall and takes you out to dinner and opens the door. And, you know, I just thought I'm never going to find this guy. And so I think there was a tremendous amount of gratitude <laughs> when I <laughs> did get married. And that that is a key of marriage is to keep that sense of gratitude that when you when you roll over and you look at this person and they've been slobbering on the pillow and that would be me <laughs> that, that, that you're like, oh, I love this person and I'm very grateful for that person. That's really, really important. And that's what does the Bible tell us over and over? Remember, remember what the Lord has done for you. Give thanks for the Lord is good. You know, in his presence is fullness of joy and realizing, God, I need to spend time in your presence so that I can be a more appreciative person. And as I as I work that muscle of giving thanks to the Lord for he is good, it also then ripples down to give thanks because, Lord, you've given me this husband. You've given me these children. You're with me in these circumstances. So work out that Thanksgiving muscle that will really, really help you in your marriage. That's wonderful. Wow. You have given so much information, so much wisdom. And some of the things like the, I love the church idea of finding that couple that, yes. you know, is older and they look like they love each. I mean, that is so wonderful right there. And I, I do hope that so many people will, you know, hey, take heed to that. One last know? question before we close it. What does technology, how does it impact marriage? This is huge just because just think of how technology has impacted relationships. Think of how we used to talk and laugh together when we we're young, but now like kids just kind of look at their phones. Like it's a, that's a very big impact. And then of course, in your marriage, that, that's where it really hits home because that's your closest person. So you can ask yourselves things like, is my spouse more interesting than my phone? <laughs> like, do I think my spouse is more interesting? And it's like, your spouse probably used to be more interesting, but now that you know your spouse really well, you're like, the phone really provides a lot more novelty and thrill and entertainment and doesn't ask anything of you. And so that's what we have to realize is the phone can be this endless entertainment. It can help us escape. It can help us medicate, soothe, whatever it is, and it expects zero from you. All you have to do is show up. And, and whenever you're sick of it, you just put it down. And that is not how relationships work. That's not how life works. The phone shows you I can have whatever I want like pointed to me. If I don't like this game, I'm going to watch something else. If I don't like this cooking show, I'm going to watch something else. It's very self-centered. And, and that's not how relationships work. It's very instant. You get your answer right away. And that's not how relationships work. You have to work towards things. It takes time. So those kinds of things fight against it. And, you know, Business Insider had said that we touch our phones upward of 2,000 times a day. You know, we're we're tapping it. We're opening it. We're swiping it. We're we're on it all the time. So it is an intention getter. It, it has our attention. And what captures our attention has our heart. And then you, you can see where this follows very much so with our relationship with the Lord, like, like, Lord, I'm supposed to set you before my eyes constantly, though scripture tells us, but am I setting my phone before my eyes? And can you find God on your phone? Can you text a love message to your spouse on your phone? Of course you can. And that's why we like it. That's what I would call a digital vegetable. But let's be honest, like when you're on your phone, how much of the time are you doing those kinds of digital vegetable activities? And so this is a call to us to say, hey, maybe let's start with no phones at mealtime, no phones during date nights, that date night you take the picture and then you put the phone away or you have it available just to hear from the babysitter, but that's all, you don't answer for anybody else. And there might be a Sabbath where it's like, hey, on Thursday nights, let's let's turn off Wi-Fi at 7 p.m. and let's just like hang out and spend time together. You know, so, so you do have to be more proactive to find times to connect. This might be the walk after dinner and you leave your phones at home. Home, but really recognizing this is a huge piece that disconnects us because instead of looking at each other, connecting with each other, listening to each other, it's just so much easier to do that with a phone. And, and you think that it's meeting your needs and it's not. So I encourage you as you listen, put technology in its place and snuggle up to your spouse and not to your phone <laughs> at the end of the day. Well, there's, there's resources out there. For marriages on www 
marriageweek.org. Yeah. So go to marriageweek.org and you'll find a dating guide that's completely free that gives you all sorts. And we kind of started out with some dates, but it'll show you like dating A through Z, like how can you kind of put some, some interest in this that's fun. And then also has a couple's connection guide that goes into more of the love languages, more into questions. You can ask each other if you're kind of like, uh, I know we're supposed to connect, but I have no idea what to talk about, you know? So, so look at that couple's connection guide. And then I have a book called 31 days to a happy husband. And that's for us wives to read, to realize I have put my husband in the, on as wallpaper for a long time, just in the back burner, you know, I need to like kind of think of him again. So 31 days to a happy husband is a great place to start with that. Wonderful. And you can find out more about Arlene and her books, Yeah, 31 days to a happy husband and 31 days to becoming a happier wife and her part, her podcast. Um, Arlene, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. The podcast comes out on Mondays. It's called the happy home podcast. I interview marriage and uh, parenting experts, and you can just do my name, ArlenePelican.com, ArlenePelican.com, and that will have all of my different resources on there. What would you like to leave my audience with today? Thank you so much for listening. You're here, which means you're interested in investing in this most important relationship, whether it's your marriage or marriage and culture that you want to be a marriage champion. And that's so amazing. And just start if you feel like you, sometimes you get the blahs or sometimes you feel hopeless. Just start with one small step. Get the ball moving in the right direction. So it just might be holding your spouse's hand today and saying, hey, I really appreciate you. And that might be where it starts. And and I love what Bill and Pam Farrell say. Um, you know, you just start somewhere that it could be like, hey, you you um you know, you you made my coffee today, or hey, you you like it could be so small, like. You, you took out the trash. Thank you. Like, just look for that little tiny thing and, and praise it. And that's a great way to start. Thanks for watching The Call. And don't forget to like and subscribe. So join me next time for another episode of The Call with Nancy Sebado. You'll be blessed. Are you listening to The Call of God? Because God speaks to you every day. Are you listening to The Call? What sound is Oh